Hey guys, my name is Tensor. Welcome back to the Dart for Beginners tutorial series. Today we're sort of going to go back to some of the stuff that we talked about in the last video, except this time we're going to look at it at a much lower level. And we're also going to look at control flow structures inside of Dart. I mentioned in the last video that the instructions that you give to Dart are read by the application in a sequential order when I was talking about imperative programming. Now Dart is an imperative programming language. However, it is a little misleading to think that you're really writing instructions to your computer, at least directly. Instead, what we're doing is creating Dart and then we're passing it through a compiler, which then creates bytecode. And this bytecode then goes to the computer, which reads it. And you can think of the bytecode as just binary because a computer can only really understand binary. And then the computer will typically give us some kind of output if we want it to, though it doesn't necessarily have to. And then we can continue this flow. So you can't just take Dart and give it to your computer and expect your computer to do something with it. And that's why you actually have to install the Dart virtual machine because the virtual machine is what allows us to essentially translate the Dart into machine bytecode for the computer to understand. Dart's compiler has two main modes. The first one is called the JIT compiler and the JIT compiler stands for just-in-time compilation. As you give code to the compiler, it then converts it into bytecode, and it is then read by your computer. Having this feature with Dart is actually pretty useful, and it's what enables Flutter to have hot reloading. When you're developing an application, you typically have an Android or an iOS emulator open, you can be running your application in this emulator, and because we have hot reloading, we can go ahead and change some of the lines of our code and then save the program, and it will automatically reflect those changes inside of the emulator because the compiler will take the changes, recompile them, and then push them over to the emulator. The other method of compilation that Dart uses is called ahead of time compilation. Ahead of time compilation is just like it sounds. Rather than compiling everything at runtime, like the JIT does, we can compile everything beforehand and create a binary. For those of you who do not know what a binary is, on Windows it's a .exe file, on Linux it's a .sh file, on Android it's a .apk file, and so on and so forth. So when I want to publish my Flutter program, I'll use ahead of time compilation because this will allow me to produce an APK and an executable for iOS. This ahead of time compilation is also what makes it possible for Flutter to work on desktop systems. With a fairly basic understanding of compilation, let's talk about types and why they're important. Up until Dart 2 was released, Dart was considered to be a dynamically typed programming language. This means that the types didn't matter until the code was called at runtime. And the compiler would essentially work around the types that the user passed to it. So if you didn't pass any types, the compiler would infer what types of types you would need in your application and then optimize the code based on those inferences. With Dart 2, however, Dart has become a statically typed programming language but it also still has a bit of a hybrid approach in some senses. If we look at the code here, we are declaring a variable x using the var keyword. So we're not declaring a specific type for this variable and we're passing a reference to the integer five to this variable x. If I hover over the x variable, however, you can see here that the compiler knows that x will be an integer. And that's because we're putting the reference for the integer five into x. Now, if I decide to add a second line here where I'm reassigning x to a new value, this time a string with the character five inside of it, you'll see here that we'll actually get an error as denoted by these red squiggly lines below the actual five. And this error is a result of X expecting to receive an integer, but receiving a string instead. 
Now, if I want to correct this and make it so that X can take in an integer and a string, I can add a type to X called dynamic. So now X is a dynamically typed variable and it can take in an integer, it can take in a string, and it can really take in any type inside of Dart. The dynamic type is a bit of a leftover from Dart 1 rather than giving us actual dynamic typing inside of Dart. This is a object that essentially covers all of the other objects inside of Dart, meaning all of the other types and objects that are created inside of Dart are considered to be under the dynamic banner. So it's the most general type that we can actually use inside of this language. Now the main reason why you wouldn't want to use dynamic types everywhere inside of Dart is because you would actually lose a lot of performance by doing so. And this is because of how types actually relate to how a program assigns memory to its execution. So if we go ahead and we preface x with an integer and set it equal to 5 and then we go ahead and we create a second variable called y make it dynamic and set it equal to 5 and then print out the two the integer will actually take up less memory than the dynamic y even though both of these variables have a reference to the same value inside of them and this is simply the case because the compiler treats an integer and a dynamic differently Here's a list that has various different types inside of it. We have an integer, a string, a double, a boolean, a function, a symbol, a ruins object, a list of integers, and then a map. And while this list is completely legal, I do not recommend that you actually use a list with more than one type inside of it. If we hover over the x value, you can see that the compiler is actually inferring that this list is a list of object type rather than a list of dynamic type. The dynamic type generalizes all types under one umbrella, meaning we can say x is dynamic, therefore it can have an integer, a double, a string, or and so on inside of it, whereas the object type is the type that all other types are derived from. Both of them are not very efficient inside of memory, and so you should do your best to avoid using them for your type annotations in your programs. In the last video, we already kind of looked at strings, though it's worth looking at strings under a microscope. Inside of our main function here, we have a print statement, and then we have a string with double quotes that just says this is a string. If I make another print statement and I add yet another string, this time with single quotes, these two strings will actually be equivalent. So you can create a string with either double quotes or single quotes, and both of these data structures will be exactly the same. So you can either use double quotes or single quotes to create your strings. It really doesn't matter, though I do recommend that you choose one and use it for consistency's sake. In the last video, we also mentioned that we have access to what's called string interpolation with strings. So I can define two variables, one up here called x, which is equal to 1.4, and then another one here called y, which is equal to 2. And then if I want to actually put these values inside of a string, I can go ahead and use string interpolation. So we'll create a string here called a, and it'll say add numbers. Then we'll use a dollar sign followed by the variable name. So here we have x, and this will substitute 1.4 in for this space in the string. And then I also have another dollar sign followed by y, which will substitute in y's value, which is 2. And then after that, I have a dollar sign followed by an open curly bracket, followed by x plus y, followed by a closed curly bracket. With this block, we're actually adding x and y together, and that will then be put inside of the string. If you want to, you can surround a single variable with curly brackets like this, though it is fairly idiomatic to just write it with the dollar sign like that. And then if we want to put an entire block of code, we use a dollar sign with curly brackets.
So because we're adding X and Y together and we're using the plus operator here, we need to use the curly brackets, otherwise it will not work. As you can see here, if I remove the brackets, all we're getting is the X variables value and we're not getting the plus Y's value. Instead, we'll just get plus Y. And here's what this string interpolation looks like. It just says add numbers followed by 1.4 and two, and then the actual sum of the two numbers. Now let's talk about Boolean values. So I'm sure when some of you first learned what a Boolean value was in the last video, that it could only be true or false, you thought, well, what's the point of this value in particular? Well, Boolean values are a part of what's known as Boolean algebra, which is a mathematical field which deals with logic. And actually, the computer is technically a very complicated Boolean algebra machine because it only uses a Boolean value of either 0 or 1. And in fact, some of the older languages didn't have a formal Boolean type. Instead, you would either have to use 0 or 1, with 1 being true and 0 being false. In particular, Booleans are very useful when it comes to control flow. We have an if statement inside of Dart. The if statement allows us to check to see if a condition is true or false. So here we have an if statement and it says if t and if this statement which is just the variable t is true then we'll print out that it was true. Down here we have another if statement which says if f and we know that f is false but because f is always going to be false, it will not actually print out this code. So this code will actually never run because this will always evaluate to false. So if we run this application, you can see we only get back the first print statement. You can expand if statements with an else clause. So this checks to see if this conditional is true, which we know the boolean itself is false. And if this is false, then it executes the code after the else clause. The flow of execution will start at the very top of our main function. It'll come down, we'll assign t to true and f to false. Then it will check to see if t is true, in which case it will then run this print statement. Then as it comes down, it will check to see if f is true, which it's not. So it will skip over this entire block of code and then immediately go on to this block of code. So we'll just get out a print statement that says it was true, followed by a print statement that says it was false above. Let's now take a look at some of the conditional Boolean operators that exist inside of Dart. So we've got double equals, and as you can see here, it, my code ligatures makes it look like one giant equals sign, whereas it's literally just two equal signs, one after the other. This signifies equal to, so if we have a value on one side and a value on the other, it checks to see if those two values are equal to one another, and then if they are, it returns true, and if they aren't, then it will return false. Next, we have not equal to. This is an exclamation point followed by an equal sign. And my code ligatures just makes it look like an equal sign with a cross through it. This is the inverse of this execution up here. If two values, one on each side, are equal to one another, then we'll return false. Otherwise, we'll return true. We then have greater than and less than. So if we have a value, say, 10 on this side, and then a value 1 on this side, then this will come back as true because 10 is greater than 1. And less than, again, is the inverse of greater than, with the smaller number needing to be on the left side, and the larger number needing to be on the right side for it to come back as true. We also have greater than or equal to and less than or equal to. These, of course, check to see if a value is either equal to or greater than or equal to or less than. And again, they produce true or false, depending. And then finally, we have negation, with it just being an exclamation point. And negation just works like it does in mathematics, where it's literally just a negative version 
of the boolean so if we have false and we negate it then we'll get back true and if we have true and we negate it then we'll get back false and of course this can also apply to any of these conditionals with the negation we can take our false value f and this will always return true because the negation of false is always going to be true so we'll always print out this negative false statement and we'll never print out the else clause and here's an example of one of these conditionals from below where we're using the less than sign we're just checking to see if one is less than 10 and if it is then we'll just print out one is less than 10 and of course this will come back as true and so we'll get this value let's take a look at a more complicated example here we have an if statement where we check to see if one is less than 10 and if it is then we'll print out one is less than 10 we are now chaining it together with another if statement using the else clause we'll check to see if this here inside of the parentheses comes back as true and if it does then we'll just print out what's inside of this block of code if this came back as false then we would come down to this next if statement and see if it comes back as true because remember the else part of an if statement only runs if the original conditional comes back as false this if statement will never actually execute also this next else if statement will never actually print even if the conditional is truthy and that's because like i said this resolves to true and therefore these other two else if statements just never get executed if we want to of course we can just remove the else blocks and now it'll go down check to see if this part is true and then execute the block inside of the curly brackets and then it'll move to the next if statement and it'll keep going like that so with the else statements we just get back negative false and then we just get back the first print statement which is just one is less than 10 but without the else statements we get back one is less than 10 one is greater than or equal to zero and then the will never print statement let's take a look at while loops real quick while loops are interesting because they allow us to reuse code until a conditional is false so here we have a variable x which we're setting to the reference of 10 and we are checking to see if 10 is greater than 1 which of course will come back as true and if it is then we will loop through this block of code over and over and over again until this becomes false in the block of code we're printing out the value of x inside of a string using string interpolation and then we're using an operator called decrement and decrement just takes the value of x and subtracts it by one and this is signified by using double minus like this we'll get 10 we'll subtract it by one then we'll loop again with 9 as x and then we'll subtract one then we'll loop again with 8 as x and this will go until x is equal to one in which case this conditional will not be satisfied the code will exit out of the wall loop and here you can see we start at 10 and we go all the way down to 2 and then as soon as x equals 1 the wall loop does not continue so loops are pretty good when you want to reuse a block of code and in this case we're just reusing the print statement and then we're mutating x because we only want this block of code to execute nine different times you can also use the wall keyword in what's called a do wall loop this loop is actually exactly the same as the loop that we had down here except the only difference is that the conditional check actually happens after the looping so we loop the first time with 10 then we check the conditional then we loop the second time with 9 then we check the conditional and this will go on until it hits 2 and once it hits 2 it'll print out 2 and then it'll decrement and then this will be false and it will exit like it did before complementary to the while loop is a for loop the for loop allows us to put the initialization of the variable inside of the parentheses as well as the increment or decrement or whatever mutation we want to do to this value. So here we have 
our initialization of the x variable. Then we have our conditional, which checks to see that x is greater than one. And then we have our decrement mutation, which mutates x every single time the for loop executes. So rather than having the decrement at the end of the loop, we can just have it up here and it will still work exactly the same. So this will then execute this block of code until this conditional is not satisfied anymore. Now, interestingly enough with the for loop is the variable that we declare here is actually what is called scoped to the for loop, meaning it's not accessible outside of the for loop itself. Our value of x here cannot be printed outside of the for loop at the bottom. And the same is mostly true for every block inside of Dart. So if you have a bunch of curly brackets around something and you declare a variable inside of those curly brackets, then generally you will not have access to that variable outside of those curly brackets. To kind of show this off, I can declare another variable called y and set it equal to x plus one. And then if I try to print y outside of the for loop again, I can't access it. However, if I initialize y outside of the loop and then I set y equal to x plus one inside of the loop, then I'll be able to access y outside of the for loop. Anyway guys, in a future tutorial we'll talk more about scoping, but just keep it in mind for now. Alright guys, well I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you dislike this video, then by all means download it as much as you like. Have a good night.